Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Of course you would. And when it comes to great rates on insurance, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters coverage. Plus, at an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And Geico is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com or contact your local agent today. How will Captain Ned Lowe and George possibly escape from the hold and regain control of the ship? H. Bedford Jones, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. We are proudly supported by our listeners. Many, many thanks to our financial supporters who pitch in every month to help us keep the lights on. If you enjoy the show, please sign up to be a supporter for as little as $5 a month. We'll give you a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook order. Give more and you get more. Go to classictalesaudiobooks.com and become a financial supporter today. Thank you so much. And if you can't support us financially at this time, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And if you prefer listening on YouTube, our channel is now up to date and will continue to be so. We are going to have a pirate summer. Seeing the end of this story on the horizon, I'm not quite ready to go ashore. I've just got my sea legs on. So this summer, we will continue to present piratical adventures of the seven seas. By thunder, there won't be a timber that hasn't been shivered when we're through. And now, Pirate's Gold, Part 3 of 4, by H. Bedford Jones. Chapter 7 The passage of time was nothing to us as we lay in the pitch darkness amid the powder and the cabin stores. Indeed, we lay there the whole day unheeded, all hands being busy above. But the day seemed like weeks to us. Ned Lowe had heard some smattering of talk while he and I were being chained in the lazarette, enough to show him that the mutiny had come about through Polly Langton. He had heard Spry swearing that they would stand by the lass and see us hanged for the pirates we were which indeed appeared proof positive. Yet she was no navigator, though a good seaman and all else. So how could she hope to bring the ship to any port? Ned, I asked during the weary wait. Do you mind that little black box I brought aboard from Langton? You've never said how it was he had the chart. I had left it with him to compare with a paper he had in Franklin's writing, said Ned Lowe. Poor Langton. Little he guessed what was up this cruise. Well, I said, for one, I'm not so sure about Polly's being the chief mutineer. That devilish little wastrel Dickon has more infernal brain than we credited him with. I think now twas he tried to get me with his knife that day Humphrey Stave was killed. And Gunner Basil is a bad one for certain, though he may be holding to his pious pose. But where's Boson Pilcher? He'll not turn against us. He was on deck when they nabbed me, came Lowe's voice. Aye, he's true. And so is Black Philip. But that cursed Thomas Winters! I'd like to know what John Russell had to say about the dog. Ned, I said, after a long space of silence. Tell me about your chase after this trunnel Toby. And that day Humphrey Stave was killed, you remember? You said how five years ago... That night, something had happened. What is it all, Ned? What reason lay behind you and the wine-dark sea? Oh, art quoting Homer to me, eh? Ned Lowe's laugh rang bitter, but ended in a soft word. George, sometimes I think the waves are weary with weeping. But, Shaw. Sure. Five years ago, I had everything in life, George. University honors, a home and family and the promise of a girl I loved. 
These words had tumbled out of him, as it were, jerkily to the flitting of his thought. Now for a little he was silent and finally spoke. His voice was hoarse, whether from the thirst that we had or from the tumult of his spirit I know not. Why, George, that is a lengthy recital, and I am no teller of tales. But since we have a quiet watch below, shall out with the yarn and appease your curiosity. It is no such thing, I broke in. It is interest and friendliness, and you know it. I and your pardon, lad, he answered and sighed. I have grown cynical of men, George, and belief comes hard to my lips. But my heart is sound enough and loves you. You've never been in the West Country, by Rex Hahn and March Wheel, and the Brondig Hills, and Watts Dyke, along the Welsh Country? No nearer than London Town, I responded. Then take my word for it, no lovelier country may be found, George. My father was a magistrate and a knight and of latter years had grown wealthy through his shares in the company of Hudson's Bay. And one day he gave sentence to a poacher for killing a hare. A seaman it was, who had wandered riotously up from Bristol, spending guineas by the way. Guineas gone, the seaman headed for Bristol again, trapping the hedges for meals, and so fell foul of the law and was taken. My father sentenced him to transportation, even the man's name was not known. He was a man with long face, they say, and melancholy eyes and a voice like a roaring wind when he flung out curses, a gold ring fast in his nostrils, and over his heart was tattooed a crimson, bleeding heart. That, and the name he went by, was all the picture I could gain of him. Well, into jail he was clapped, cursing and swearing bitter vengeance upon my father, who had sentenced him. Two days later came travellers, shipmen going to Bristol, and they heard of the man and viewed him as he lay in jail. They recognised him for one Trunnell Toby, a man famed for foul deeds and piracies. Word of it came to London, and he was sent for to be hanged at Tyburn as a notable example to other pirates. So they took him away, chained him like a beast. How he did it I know not, but he slew both his guards and escaped clear away. And on a Sunday night he came, bringing other rogues with him, to Ravenscroft Hall, where my father lived. Now the hoarseness gained upon Ned Lowe, so that for a little he sat in silence, and I could hear his dry mouth working. I had by this time caught the drift of what was afoot and guessed whither his tale led. The telling of it would ease his heart, so I kept still and let him go his own gait. He resumed presently, speaking soft and low. There was a lass I loved, George, and since my parents were lonely, often she would come to the hall and spend a day or two. She was spending that Sunday so, when this foul Trunnell Toby and his mates arrived. They picked their time, knowing that few of the servants would be about. Well, they broke in and slew like dogs gone mad in summer's heat. They slew and robbed, plundering Ravenscroft as they would have plundered any ship on the high seas. Two of the dogs fell under my father's steel ere they pistoled him. Toby himself fired the shot, and that same bullet slew my mother. The dear lass they murdered likewise, and fled with their booty, having horses in waiting. And the devils got clear away, George, clear away. They had a ship waiting by Bristol, and Trunnell Toby was captain of her. To this I was called home from Oxford. One of the two whom my father slew lived long enough to tell who and why, and then died. For a fortnight, I was like a man out of his wits, and then I fell to work. I raised what money I could, sold off what lands were free, and went to London. There, I bought a stout sloop, armed her and manned her with the scurviest knaves could be picked up. 
There was a devil in me then, lad. For all I was just turned twenty-one, I made those knaves fear me most bitterly. So he put to sea, and since that day I have never lessened in the search for Trunnell Toby. A year, and I was captaining my own ship, a fine fast ship that we took from a French rover off Brazil. They had little ease who sailed with me, I promise you. We were on the account, sure enough, but we molested no innocent trader, George, only hunted up and down the seas whatever ship Trunnell Toby might be in. He heard of it, and others heard of it, for I hanged every man that had sailed with him or shared with him. More than once, as I have told you, I came close to him, but the hound was wary. I made the sea so hot for him that men were afraid to ship under him, and he was forced to take lesser berths. Always he fled from me, for he knew why I was after him, although no one else knew the reason, and he was afraid to face me. Ah, but he is a man of blood past reckoning, a fiend in human form, George. I have heard how he has dealt with captive men and women, so that your blood would freeze to imagine it. And he's no coward, either. Only last year, with some small boats, he boarded a Portuguese Indiaman in the very harbour of Funchal, slew every soul aboard her, and with the remnants of his men, worked her out from under the shore guns. I was there a week later and heard the tale, and tracked him to the African coast. Indeed, I found the ship in the Guinea River, up a bit from the English factory at Sierra Leone, and I took her. Every man aboard her I hanged. But Trunnell Toby himself got ashore and fled among the blacks up the river. There I lost him, for I pursued with boats and discovered that he had doubled back to the coast again and escaped me in a ship bound for Virginia with slaves. And since then I have been able to obtain not the slightest trace of him. Most like he is in Virginia now, with my share of Franklin's gold, I'll buy this ship and start out anew. I think I'll find him in Virginia, for he's poor and without followers, and even the brethren of the coast are afraid to sail with him for fear I'll trace them down and hang them. And that's the reason behind me, George Roberts. You've told it to Polly Langton, I demanded. The Lord forbid, exclaimed his voice, startled. I've told it to none save you. Then no wonder she deems you a common pirate, I said thoughtfully. I forbid you to mention it, George. Oh, I'll not. I thank you for the confidence, Nedlow. And if it's ever in my power to aid you, count on me. But for the present. Sounds. Here we are chained up like felons, and what's to come of it? He made no answer to this. Presently, for all my pondering on that sad story of his, on the wreck which had been made of his life, I fell asleep from utter weariness. It was after night when I wakened, for the trap to the cabin above was open and David Spry was coming down with a lantern and food and mugs of ale. Ned Lowe was asleep, and Spry stirred him with his foot until he sat up, then gave us the food and ale and watched us make way with it. His dour, gloomy face was saturnine. Wind be falling, he announced, and we're like to raise the islands tomorrow. Ned Lowe glanced up at him. You'll raise nothing but the coast of hell, you mutinous dog. Aye, by your guidance. David Spry grinned, then sobered. He sat him down on an ale keg and regarded us while he played with his knife in one hand. Harky, masters, the ship's ours. Mistress Polly be in command of she, and Thomas Winter the captain. Winter, I said, choking on my ale. Are you mad? Nay, I can navigate right well, said David Spry, and grinned again. Now, Master Winter bain't a man of God, not he, nor Gunner Basil neither, for all his pretended repentance. But did we not in here and swear in great oaths? Aye nor Bowles Pilcher, neither. And they all say to hang the two of ye and take the ship. We'll not abide this, masters. We listened to him in stark amazement. He was in deadly earnest, 
and we realized that he was speaking for the hands forward no less than for himself. But Pilcher... Need not call us mutineers, masters, he went on. We be honest men. You be rogues and scoundrels belike. And for the lady up above, we've took the ship over and saved the blood of honest men from your hands. You unregenerate sons of Belial, take shame to yourselves. We aim be honest British men and sail not with murderers and pirates and such like. Yet you're going to murder us, put in Ned Lowe. Not us, master. Set them ashore, maybe. The man rose and took our mugs. Think of your sins now, and do we spend a night at prayer? It won't hurt you none. He climbed up again through the trap, which he left open, perhaps for convenience. We remained in the darkness. Presently I heard Ned Lowe chuckle. George, sink me if this isn't the richest joke ever perpetrated. Here that lass has taken my own ship from me, bloody Ned, and is mistress of the ship herself. The joke will end as it began, with death, I said broodingly. These long noses have seen through Gunner Basil at last, it appears. That's one good thing. But what do you think about Thomas Winter, eh? Who dreamed that the lout could navigate? Or is he lying to the others about his ability? A whistle broke from Ned Lowe. Damn me, George. I'd give a thousand pound to know what it was John Russell. Make it five thousand, I said. And Russell might come back from hell to tell you. He laughed at that. I doubt it. So those devils are figuring on hanging us, eh? I'm surprised that the bosun is with them. He's not, I said. I know Pilcher, Ned, and he's a true man. But listen, there's a light above. Through the open trap, we saw a light in the cabin above. It darted down, a square of radiance, and with the roll of the ship illumined our prison chamber by flashes, now here, now there. Both Ned Lowe and I were ironed wrist and ankle, and chains ran from the irons to ring bolts in the deck, so that we had freedom of movement but no liberty. Between us was a small keg of excellent port, laid aboard for cabin use, and I knew we would not die of thirst or suffer from it again. Now a voice came to us from the cabin. The words we could not catch, although by the tone it was the voice of Gunner Basil. Right after it came the clear high tones of Polly Langton. Nay, I will not. I am weary, I tell you, and shall do no talking until tomorrow. Let the two men lie in peace. Look to it, Gunner. And you, Boson. If harm comes to them, you both hang, I swear it. Time enough tomorrow for a talk. Pilcher made roaring response, perhaps in order that we might hear. But, mistress, the men want to know if you be with them or no. It's for your sake we have taken the ship. You and the gunner and that man Winter can talk with me at eight bells in the morning and not before, came her response. And after this, nothing. Presently the light vanished from above. A bowl or porringer, in which some food had been fetched, remained with us. I took this and set it under the spigot of the keg, and drew some port. After drinking, I passed it along to Ned Lowe. I have a pipe, but no tobacco, Ned. Here's Baca and a tinderbox. Neither of us spoke until I had managed, with some trouble, to get the good brown weed alight and had passed the pipe to Ned Lowe. Did you get the catch in her voice, Ned? I asked. And she's sparring for time, do you mind? Come, Ned. Things are not quite so obvious as we thought. The lass is having hard work of it somehow. Bah, nothing of the sort, growled he. The jade has come to realize that neither she nor Winter can navigate, that's all. She's afraid. By morning, George, they'll make us an offer if we'll navigate for them. Wait and see. I was not so sure about this, and events proved my doubts well-founded. Who keeps the keys of these irons, Ned? I asked suddenly. He laughed harshly. The gunner? 
There's a spare set of keys in the chart locker, but small use they are to us here. By the movements of the ship, we soon perceived that the sea was going down, but the night wore away intolerably for us, and the thought of being thus chained like slaves for any longer time was past endurance. We had worse than thoughts to torment us, however, worse even than the rats which scurried about and over us until movement frightened them. It was, I think, with the midnight change of watches, when the filtered rays of a tiny iron lantern came about the ladder, and then a sound of maudlin cursing and swearing. Down the ladder tumbled the boy, Dickon, by some miracle preserving the lantern unhurt as he fell, and picked himself up with more oaths. He was, to put it bluntly, drunk as a lord. He set the lantern on the ladder and turned to us cursing and reviling us with the tongue of an errant pirate. A vast change had come about in him. He had knotted a red kerchief about his head, wore a shirt looted from my bag, and had donned my sea boots, which came nearly to his knees. About his waist were belted pistols, though unloaded, and in his hand he held a deadly little gimlet dirk, a round-handled weapon, the blade protruding from the fingers of his clenched fist. Pirates, is it? he maundered, coming toward us. Sink me, but I have been a cabin boy to Avery, and this is a poor pack of thieves and woolsack rogues. There, you lousy dogs, wake up and give tongue. And I had my way, you'd walk the plank come sun up. Aye, and if the old gunner had his way too. With this he fetched me a kick and stood regarding us drunkenly, the devil in his face. Cabin boy with Avery indeed. Avery had died before the young rascal was breached. Stare at me, dogs! He leered at us as he spoke. Aye, damn ye for cowardly curs. Silly old Langton never dreamed was all cut and dried, eh? Nor you, cold bloody Ned. I'll blood ye and a pox take ye. With this he leaned forward and jabbed that little dirk of his into the calf of Ned's leg. The same instant my foot took him in the waist, all my weight back of it. Oof! The air burst out of him. He went back, head first among the boxes, dropping the dirk as he fell. Groaning, holding his hands to his middle, he rose up. Then Ned flung the pewter porringer at him and caught him across the eyes. A howl broke from the imp. Catching up the lantern, he scrambled back whence he had come, and his groans died out overhead. Sickened him? And well done, too, said Ned, laughing. He leaned forward, and with his foot raked in the dirk. Here's the first symptom of hope we've had, George. Aye, I have it. A good little weapon. Did the pup hurt you? This scratch. He'd have murdered us if he'd been let alone. Did you mark what he said about Langton, George? All cut and dried, quoth he. I recalled now how Dickon and Gunner Basil had been thick from the very start. It was clear enough that they had fooled Dennis Langton into shipping them. Yet we vainly sought a reason until I recalled the tale Pilcher had told me, and laid it before Ned Lowe with some further details that I had forgotten when I first confronted Basil. That must be the right of it, Ned, I concluded. Gunner Basil served under Avery, do you mind? And this talk about knowing where Avery's gold was hid? Do you think it's the same gold we're after? It's not, said Ned stoutly. I was at the taking of this hoard. None but Franklin and I knew where it was hid. It may well be, however, that Avery buried some other gold about the islands, and that the gunner knew of it. Avery's been dead long years. Yet I don't like the smell of it all, George. To me it looks like a plan ready laid. All cut and dried, said he. I'd give a thousand pound if I knew what it was John Russell wanted to say about winter. He's below, came a sudden low voice. We fell silent. Below, Captain. Art well? Aye, responded Ned Lowe. Who's there? Me, Philip. What can I do for you, master? Lord, but how my heart leaped at those words. The black cook! Get the keys from the chart locker and loose us from the irons, snapped Ned swiftly. Hope thrilled in his voice, 
and I felt eagerness surge through me. Philip was a true man, and... A curse. A shrill cry. The sound of trampling feet came to us, and the voice of Gunner Basil poured forth furious oaths. He had come upon Philip, had discovered him aft, and now drove him forward with blows and beery revelings. Evidently a cask had been broached forward. And so our hopes died even more swiftly than they had arisen. All became silent up above. Well, quoth Ned philosophically, better luck next time, lad. And at least I have the little Dirk. It was small consolation, to me at least. Chapter 8 With the morning, suddenly and most terribly, there is laid open before us the whole book of villainy which those above were writing. No, not the whole book, either. One page of it was still hidden from us. David Spry came down to us again, left us food and ale, and went his way without saying a word, hurriedly. A little while afterward, voices came to us through the trap, which remained open. The first voice which reached us was that of Spry himself. I am come to speak for them for it, he said. The boatswain is a child of darkness, and we who be honest men will have not to do with his decisions. I say to your face, Gunnar Basil, that we are doubt of your regenerate state, and I demand to be heard among ye. The gunner's whine rose, but with an ugly note to it. I accept the burden which be laid upon me, I the burden of doubt and mistrust, for my sins stow it commanded a new voice, curtly and with irritated contempt. Stow it, ye swab! As for you, David Spry, ye are dead right, lad. Aye, sit among us, and welcome. Light came filtering down to us through the open trap. I stared at Ned Low, and he at me, with open wonder and astonishment. What voice was this? It was new to us. We could not place it. Then even as we stared came the answer to our wondering. Polly Langton's voice floated to us. Well, Thomas Winter, where is the bosun? On deck, returned Winter. One of us must keep the deck, miss. Will you sit? From Ned Low broke a low ejaculation. Winter indeed. There was no daft vacancy in this voice. It was the full-throated growl of a seaman, as different from the man's usual tones as day from night. The sickening conviction broke upon me full force. Ned, it was a plot from the very start, I said softly with an oath at my own past blindness. He and the gunner and Dickon, perhaps others. The man was no half-wit at all. We are a trifle late discovering the matter. And Ned Low smiled whimsically. Now let us have an understanding once and for all. Polly Langton spoke up coolly, quiet command in her voice, and I could imagine her level eyes sweeping from man to man. You have taken this ship from her officers and owners, claiming to do it on my behalf, but without any orders or bidding of mine. Thus far I have consented to the matter, for the ship was in storm and distress, now speak out your purposes flatly. What mean you to do? There was a moment of silence. Ned Low looked at me and made a grimace. Here was a morsel of news indeed. We thought that the lass had been a party to our captivity. But now the matter appeared otherwise. As for me, I felt a glow of warmth and joy, since it had been hard for me to lose faith in her. Mistress, began Gunner Basil. It be in the purposes of Providence. Stow it, commanded Thomas Winter. David Spry, do ye answer the lady. There was something grim, something significant, in the way this man spoke to Gunner Basil. I remembered how I had overheard him addressing the gunner formerly in the cabin, and instinctively I began to feel a cold chill at thought of the man. Gunner Basil was no baby, but a murderous scoundrel himself. Yet the gunner obviously stood in blank fear of this man Winter, whom we had accounted a daft person. 
Ned Lowe must have felt something of the same sense, for he murmured to me, Mark, tis Winter who gives orders, Winter who captains the ship, Winter who navigates her. Why, mistress, broke in the cold voice of David Spry from the cabin above, we be honest men, some of us at least. Do we mind how, that day Simon and Ezra Blake were murdered, and men lashed, ye cried to us to stand by ye, against the pirates and bloody rogues? Well, we are done so, and that be all. All, you say? spoke out the girl. What say you, Winter, and you, Gunner? Aye, they answered together. And what is your purpose now, David Spry? she demanded. Do you know why we sail to the Verde Islands? Aye, mistress, he responded. We are heard talk of gold. We stand with ye, I say, and we be honest men. We want no gold but our pay. We'll not see they pirates do more robbery and murder, nor take the ship from ye, mistress. We'll art no more to do with they sons of Belial and darkness. Do ye say the word now, and we stand with ye? Oh, said the girl's voice. What say you to that, Winter? And you, Gunner? Aye, they answered again. Then her voice leaped out at them. Very well. If you be minded to obey me, Winter, go above and take the deck and send Boson Pilcher down here. Ned Lowe gave me a shove with his foot and grinned admiringly. I awaited the answer. It came with a scrape of feet and the heavy tread of Thomas Winter leaving the cabin. Immediately afterward, the girl spoke, but softly, so that we could hardly hear her. Gunner, what and who is that man? Since the day we left the Thames, he has been known to all aboard as a man of poor sense, no better than a fool. Now he is lucid, and you obey him, and he navigates the ship. Why, mistress, tis the dispensation of providence, replied Gunner Basil in oily tones. I know him no more than you, but praise be, in the hour of need he has been lifted up as a horn of salvation to us. What had we have done else for a navigator, mistress? If it be not a plain case of providence, I know not. Now Pilcher made his appearance evidently, for Polly Langton addressed him bluntly. Bose, these other men have declared that they have taken the ship on my behalf, will stand by me and take my orders. What say you? I say now, as I said afore, said Pilcher, that Captain Roberts be no pirate. But as for standing by ye, mistress, I say I to that. What's done is done. I obey. Very well, then we are agreed, said the girl. These are my orders. First, that we complete our voyage and get that for which we have come. Second, that the treasure be divided among those to whom it belongs, me and Captain Lowe and Mr. Roberts. Third, that these two gentlemen be kept confined until the division is made, then be given their shares and free passage ashore at the first port we make. Now, lads, speak out, yes or no. That's fair, mistress, said David Spry. I agree. As righteous men said Gunner Basil. We ought to hand they over to the law, but I say aye to your orders, mistress, aye. And you, Bose? she asked. Aye, said Pilcher. Very well. See that it be so done. Who among you elected Winter captain? It was agreement, miss, said David Spry. He could navigate. Very well. It is understood. The sound of feet and the scrape of chairs told us that the conference was over. I was about to speak when Ned Lowe, his head cocked on one side, made a gesture of caution. I waited. A moment afterward we caught a soft sound of laughter and the voice of Gunner Basil, shorn of its wine. Ah, Dickon, here's a mug of wine, you devil's imp. Now run and tell our captain, blast his soul, to step down here and finish the bottle with me. Move, you damned pup! A mocking retort from Dickon, and the boy fled on his errand. I sat motionless and stared at Ned Lowe. We waited expectantly, 
and were soon rewarded. Winter's heavy tread jarred the deck, and Gunnar Basil greeted him with another laugh and an invitation. I had no time to drink, you black dog, responded Winter's suddenly masterful voice. It went well? Aye, said the gunner. She's after the gold right enough. Good. Then we'll not have to squeeze the location out of her, said Winter. Play it fine and slip not, or I'll carve the heart out of your carcass, do you mind that? But lad, cried the gunner, when this be done, will you not run to the other island and pick up that gold I told you of? The gold that Avery buried. His own share it was. No man alive but me knows the place, now that Captain Avery be burning in hell. What say? Like enough, answered Winter indifferently, as if postponing a matter on which he were none too eager. But mind ye, we have to make the rendezvous first, lad. We are not enough hands to work ship, and we'll have less. Obey the lass, mind ye. Let her put her gold aboard afore we act. And take good care of Captain Low now, good care. I'll carry him along of us to the rendezvous. Is yet a fortnight afore the rose pink can be looked for. So gonna Basil bide patient. If ye spoil my work, I'll spread eagle ye. Now both men apparently left the cabin. I drew a long breath and met the gaze of Ned Low for the moment, wordless. But it seemed as if new life had come into him, as if these staggering disclosures had invigorated and heartened him. All the old reckless gaiety back in his eyes, he gave me a grin of sheer delighted amusement. Ha, <laughs> George, now we have the right of it. Now we have the whole scheme unfolded. Sink me else. Damn me, but the rogues were smart. Do you see, George? They were stranded in London town, most likely, or else were waiting for word from their friends, so they shipped aboard us and made a rendezvous with the Rose Pink at one of the islands. Whose ship is she? I demanded. Who's this devil winter anyhow? Damn me if I can figure it, George. The Rose Pink is a right good ship of twenty-two guns. Spriggs had her, but sold her to a Frenchman before he was taken and hanged. Whose she is now, I know not. Perhaps Winter knew all along of our errand. I amused. Not so. More likely he and the gunner and Dickon shipped with us, meaning to betray us as a prize to the Rose Pink. They did not look for so quick a passage as we made, which explains why a fortnight still lacks to the time appointed. You see how they made use of those honest fools for it? On the way they learned of what we were after and Winter is handling the matter, so Polly Langton will uncover the gold for him. Cursed clever rogue, ain't he? Too cursed clever for us, Ned. We'd better acquaint the lass with the truth. Tut, tut. She'd never believe us. It would be taken as a ruse to get clear of our irons, lad. Make no mistake, George. The devil is loose aboard here. Bo's Pilcher knows it. You heard how meek he spoke, assenting to all that was said. Take cue from him, George, and bide patient. Ned Lowe was aroused now and no mistake, and I began to see the man of energy below that gay and almost insouciant exterior. There was a bite to his words. I verily believe he was enjoying himself, was scenting the battle. Perhaps indeed he had some prescience of that which was to come. Damn it, I don't intend to stay in this hole a fortnight, I cried angrily. Will not. Philip will be back when he gets a chance. Perhaps one watches are changed and Polly takes the deck. Trust the black man, George. But what the hell can we do even if free? I demanded. We've no arms. Ned Low laughed out at this. Ha, <laughs> George. What'll we do? It'll be a sweet play, I'll warrant you. Mind now. Have patience. Leave the business to me. His tone of confidence irritated me. You're damned cocksure about it, Ned. What'll you do then? Out with it. Why, hide honour under necessity, as Falstaff has it. He chuckled again. When needs must, lad. I can play the pirate very well, I do assure you. Have faith and wait. I'm no pirate. 
I said sulkily, and shan't go on the account for any man. He laughed at that, then drew a dismal sigh. I ho. Times aren't what they were, George. Even in the good old days when Kidd and Avery were in their prime, if we'd lived a few score years ago, what roughing, bold times they were, eh? Sink me if there's any romance at sea these days. Ships in the new fore-and-aft style, all the galleons rotted out and the brave buccaneers degenerated into rascally thieves who would slit your weasen for a shilling rather than risk a fight for a thousand pound. Well, a few hours more and bloody Ned will be walking his own deck again. Then hey, for villainy. I'll slit weasens my own sweet self, and a kerchief about their head will vastly transform you, George. Should take to earrings like the bosun. Realizing that he was only playing on my ill humor, I made no response to this. The hours dragged past most unbearably, for it was stilling hot down in the lazarette. We both waited impatiently for noon to arrive, but it came on leaden wings. At length, we heard cries and the stamping of feet on deck, though what had happened we did not learn at once. A little later, Dickon came into the cabin and began to arrange it for the meals of those who were now aft. The little imp had either forgotten the loss of his dirk or else dared not mention it. Instead of closing the trap over which he moved the table, he began to shy oaths and hard biscuit down at us. In the midst of this, he gave us news. A pox on ye, dogs. Tomorrow morning we'll have the hanging of ye, he shrilled most venomously. We've raised the land, and by night we'll be hooked down. Tomorrow we'll string ye up to a merry tune. His head vanished from the opening, and we heard Gunner Basil's voice. Ah, Dickon, make no talk of hanging where the lady can hear, ye imp Satan. Out with ye now, and bear dinner. Here's Pilcher. What second mate now to eat with me? Oh, Pilcher! Be it true that land yonder be the islands, eh? What says Captain? Captain be ciphering and changing course to make the right island, said Pilcher's voice. Harky, Gunner, I had heard tales of ye for this man. Mark, I said no word this morning afore the last, but I know well enough that you and the Captain likewise aren't no chickens. What's in the wind, man? Are you for the account? If so, here's my hand on it. The two men fell into low-pitched talk, little of which we could overhear, until the half-convinced tones of Gunner Basil lifted an argument. Do I listen, Pilcher? There be an article for which all the company, like all companies on the account, be sworn, and that is not to force no married man to join us, you see. I had heard that ye be married, Pilcher. The captain might be glad o' ye, for ye know the coasts of Virginia, where we'll be bound, but if ye be joining from fear. I listened in no little amusement, while Boatswain Pilcher swore by teeth and toenails that he was not married, hated women as the devil hates holy water, and desired to go upon the account of his free will. He convinced Gunner Basil, too and only a master liar could have done that thing, especially as the two men disliked each other. It was obvious that Pilcher was trying to get into the confidence of the rogues, and was stopping at nothing to do it. We heard no more, for the gunner discovered the open trap under the table, and with an oath slammed it shut. But we had caught enough to be of great heart to us. About an hour afterward the trap was hauled open again, that imp, Dickon, had secured some rock ballast, and now began to heave the lumps of stone at us with many foul curses. He would assuredly have worked us some damage had not Thomas Winter come into the cabin and kicked him out. With Winter was David Spry. Both of them were in huge glee, and no wonder, for by some miracle, since Ned Lowe was not at all sure of having run out his easting, the island which had been sighted was no other than St. Vincent itself, the very one for which we were bound. The two men discussed this, from which we learned that before sunset the ship would be anchored, then entered up the log and departed again. I'll lay you two to one, George, quoth Ned exultantly, that they'll go after the gold 
take the boats and go this very night. If they do, we are free. I would not take his bet, however. Unless we were freed before Polly Langton left the ship, I feared that the imp, Dickon, would pistol us where we lay. And such indeed was his intent, for the lad was bloody-hearted as Winter himself. Chapter 9 Notwithstanding our hopes of the black cook, Philip, we saw nothing of him then, until later in the afternoon, by the stamping and singing above, and by the change of motion in the ship, we understood that all hands were at the braces, and the King Sagamore was beyond doubt heading up for the harbor. They'll pick the northeast haven, that being closest to the treasure, said Ned Lowe coolly. Is it rocky about there, George? No, all sand hills, and two long spits of sand protect the cove, I told him. Indeed, they might go across the end of the island to get the gold, since it cannot be over a mile and a half or two. Not they, and Ned laughed heartily. They'll row ten mile to avoid walking one. Wait and see. If Philip uses that woolly head of his, I observed, he'll come aft, get the keys, and free us the minute the anchor goes down. All hands will be busy up above. The anchor did not go down in a hurry, however, for the ship tacked about more than once before she was in shape to make the entrance to the bight. Gradually, she came to an even keel. We could hear the thunderous roar of Thomas Winter as he bellowed orders, and presently we were at rest. Our voyage was done. Almost at once, we were aware of a soft-footed scurrying up above in the cabin. I was minded to call out, but Ned Lowe restrained me. Excitement was upon both of us at the thought of Philip there, getting the keys and coming down to let us free. Philip it was, but in mighty fear, since he had no legitimate business aft. We heard a sudden ejaculation burst from him. Then, like a blow, the voice of David Spry reached down to us. What be doing here, you black man? Ah, in the captain's chests. A cry broke from Philip, then the furious thud of a blow. Spry uttered a shout which must have passed unheard on deck. The two men now began fighting across the cabin, and in the midst of this something fell between me and Ned Lowe, tinkling on the boards. The keys, cried Ned eagerly. Grab them, George. I found them and closed my fist on the precious things. Up above, the two struggling men came to the deck with a crash, and their legs showed in the opening of the trap. From Philip, a choked cry of despair and fear rang out. A moment they lay fighting there at the opening, then came gradually through, and at length fell precipitately, crashing down atop of us headlong. I saved them from broken necks, but at the cost of being knocked well-nigh senseless. When I had writhed clear, so far as the length of my chains permitted, I saw David Spry kneeling on the chest of the black and whipping out his sheath knife. Enough of that, Spry, commanded Ned Lowe. Spry looked about and found that gimlet dirk at his back. He was paralyzed. Drop the knife now. George, George, throttle him, lad. Even as the fellow raised a wild yell in his throat, I lunged forward and got him with both hands, dragging him to the deck with me. Now he was beyond reach of the dirk and knew it, fighting furiously to get at me, while Black Philip, twisting to his knees, added his strength to mine. With never a sound out of him, David Spry fought on until he was black in the face as Philip, and then suddenly collapsed. Quick, George, give Philip the keys. Now, Cook, loose my wrists, then get back up to the cabin and make all straight, and get for it, commanded Ned swiftly. Look alive, lad, look alive. Not a minute to lose. We'll take care of all here. Under the spur of his tongue, Philip fumbled about for the keys, where they had dropped out of my hand. Panting like a blown horse, he found them and worked at the ironed wrists of Ned Lowe until a sharp word broke from the latter. Done. Enough, lad. Up with ye. Leave all to us. Wait for word from us. Quick now. Obeying in his blind fashion, Philip leaped for the latter, planted a final kick in the ribs of the senseless seaman, and made the best of his way above. When he had freed his ankles, Ned Lowe knelt before me and worked on my irons with the keys. Blessed relief. In another moment, my wrists were free, and
and I was rubbing at the torn skin, while Ned freed my ankles likewise. Now, I said grimly, there will be a reckoning alow and aloft. Softly, softly, said Ned, and laughed quietly in his throat. First, give me a hand with this godly rogue. Thus, good. Now strip the shirt from him, and trust that jaw of his all shipshape. In no long time we had Spry ironed in Ned Lowe's place, and so well gagged that nothing but a stifled moan could come from him. He would not soon recover his senses, however. Give us a sneaker of that port, lad, said Ned, handing me the bent pewter bowl. Aye, a good one. Now looky, George, be not hasty to wrath, as Master Spry might say. They'll not miss this rascal, what with the excitement and all. They'll leave an anchor watch and turn in all hands soon enough. A few swallows of wine made us both sense our freedom more acutely. You'll try and take the ship tonight, then? I asked. Ned Lowe grinned. He was getting my pipe alight and had trouble with the tinder, but at length he got it drawing and shook his head. Not a bit of it, George. Mind now. We have the run of the ship here below, if we want it. We've all the cabin stores here to hand. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, lad. Let's have a sound night's sleep, keeping alternate watch, lest anyone comes down, and be ready for the morrow. Figure it out for yourself, he went on with an eager earnestness. They'll take the long boat to row around the point of the island after that gold, and they'll go at the break of day. Who'll go? Polly, for one. Thomas Winter for another. Winter will take the six honest lads from up forward to row the boat. He'll leave Gunner Basil here to keep the ship with Pilcher. Take the ship while he's gone, George. When he comes back, we'll have the dog at our mercy, eh? There was sense to this. I was forced to admit it, though somewhat against my will, for further waiting was both dangerous and irksome. If things go as you expect, I said. That's the best plan, agreed. Then let's get some food broken out before the light fails. Lord, but it's great to be free to stretch again. What if Dickon comes down here, Ned? Clap him in irons. Ned Low grinned. I'll hang that little bastard, George. I'd sooner fling him overboard, but he'd not drown, mark me. Well, I'll not hang him either, for he's only a lad. Wait and see, George, the rascal may yet hang himself. And so save Jack Ketch a job, I said. All right, Ned, I agree. Now to dine. We were not disturbed again all that evening, for it appeared that owing to the heat and the calm of the bay, dinner was served on deck. We ate our fill, luxuriated in our freedom, and let our captive snore. From the silence above, all hands were sleeping. Ned Lowe had curled up and gone to sleep, and I, on watch, was beginning to nod, when a slight noise sounded above, and then came the voice of Polly Langton softly. Are you there, Mr. Lowe? Mr. Roberts? I touched Lowe's face, and he sat up. Aye, mistress, I responded, and we are like to stay here a while, thanks to you. Oh, you must not. You don't understand. There was a break in her voice. If I had done anything else, they would not have obeyed me. Don't you see? I had to act as I have done, in order to keep where I am. When we get back with the treasure, I shall have you released at once, and then— You've been badly fooled, Miss Polly. I spoke out, throwing off Ned's warning hand. Winter and the gunner have a rendezvous at one of the islands with a pirate ship. They are using you to get the gold. Then— they mean to take this ship and join their comrades. Go with them, and bring back the gold, and trust all to us. Make them take the bosun with you, and do you have a talk with Pilcher, for he knows the whole game. He can give you proof enough of everything, but be careful. Don't let Winter suspect that you know. Ah, uh, I hear someone. I dare not say. She was gone again and what effect my words had upon her we could not tell. Although we listened for a while, we could hear nothing. Finally, Ned Lowe whispered to me, Why the hell did you tell her to take Pilcher? We don't need him, I responded, 
she may. True enough, mused Ned Low. Sink me if I don't believe her, George. Ay, she's handled things well enough, all considered. She's none of your patched and powdered fools who cry la la and fly into hysterics at the sight of blood, but an honest Devon lass with hard good sense and sober wits. George, I take back all my harsh words and thoughts about her. Then go to sleep again, I bade him. He obeyed, laughing softly to himself. The remainder of the night passed quietly. David Spry came to himself and tried to shake off his irons, but soon relapsed into immobility. The more I thought about Polly Langton's words to us, the more I admired the girl's good sense in acting just as she had done. I could see now, in the light of those few sentences from her lips, that she had done the best possible thing for all of us. She had, of course, played into Winter's hand without knowing it. Those poor, honest fools up forward, panicky over being led astray by bloody pirates and murderers, as they considered me and Ned, had undoubtedly been prodded and urged all along, ever since we weighed anchor, by Winter and the gunner. In dealing with those fanatics, the girl had been walking in slippery places and was aware of it. So all in all, I felt greatly heartened by her few words. When I waked Ned and laid myself down to sleep, it was with the feeling that we owed a large debt to Polly Langton. Morning came at last. Even before the first break of day, we were roused by the activity overhead. Obviously, winter intended to be off and away with the light, and our only fear was that he would visit us to make sure of our safety. As we later learned, we had been placed in the keeping of David Spry, and all hands were too filled with thoughts of gold to waste worry over what had become of Spry. Even Winter could not be blamed for supposing his prisoners well ironed and stowed, for he, playing a deep and desperate game, deeper even than we yet knew, was that morning on the verge of success, with the gold all but his. Ned and I broke our fast very pleasantly, and though poor Spry's eyes besought us to have pity on him, we dared not loosen his gag, promising to take care of him after a bit. Nor did we have any particular desire to ease his lot, since he had certainly made ours hard enough when he had the mastery. The stern window of the cabin above was open. We heard the men embark as soon as there was light enough to pilot the boat from the harbor. Water and provisions were placed aboard the boat, and the deep voice of Thomas Winter penetrated to us with his final orders. Then at length silence ensued, and we knew the boat had departed. Now, George! Ned Lowe drew a deep breath and then laughed out gaily. The question remains as to how many went along. Be quiet a while, lad. Give him a chance to get out of the harbour. Beshrew me if I don't pistol that cursed gunner Basil, and we do not want them to hear the shot. First get your pistol, I reminded him dryly. He caught my arm. Steps sounded above and immediately after, the voice of Gunner Basil himself, evidently addressing that imp, Dickon. What's that you want, Dickon, lad? Wine? Well, feel your cursed skin, if you will. Has deserved it, ye limb of Satan. Here, pour me a drink likewise. I'll wash my mouth clean of that damned sanctimonious talk. This time tomorrow, lad, we'll out the gold aboard and hay for the Indies. Here's luck, damn your eyes, shrilled the boy's voice. Sweet lad, murmured Ned Low. Now Dickon vomited a volley of oaths, demanding to know why he had not been taken, along with the others. That black scum of a cook must go, he swore roundly, and that dog Pilcher, and they six godly fools from Forret, eight sons of dogs at the oars, with the captain and his lass in the stern, and me left here, damn their eyes, hope the damn boat sinks with all hands. Gunner Basil fell a-laughing at these oaths and valorous wishes. "'You and me, Yonker,' he responded. "'Got to stick here idle while they work. Aye, the captain knows Gunner Basil can lay a gun. Guzzle away, ye varlet, and I'll go set me a fish-line for it. There be mighty fish in these waters.' For a while there was silence. Ned and I conferred together, being in no haste. 
and were delighted by the news we had gained. Those two were alone on board, which made things so much easier for us. Basil alone was sufficient to guard the ship, and Winter had wanted all the hands possible along to work out the treasure, as well as to row the longboat, which was a heavy craft. All of a sudden, we heard a satanic chuckle from above, and then the head of Dickon appeared in the trap. The boy was half drunk, and I looked up to see a pistol in his hand. Staring down into the darkness, he could for the moment see no details. Now, you dogs! he shrilled at us in maudlin tones. Now you have it, bloody Ned. I'll bleed the both of ye, blast your damn souls. Ned and I must have realized at the same instant that the little devil was run amuck. We sprang up together, but collided and fell back. He, weaving the pistol about in his unsteady hand, uttered a wild laugh and more curses. I'll bleed ye, you dogs, he went on. I'll show you who's the best pirate aboard this damn ship, damn ye. Take that! And there's more for ye where it come from. The roar of the pistol, volleying smoke and flame in our very faces, proved his words. Only that collision with Ned had saved my life, for the thing bellowed not a yard above my head. I was already heaving for the ladder again, and this time made it, and was up at the murderous little wretch while he still peered through the smoke. He uttered a strangled cry and rolled aside, but I was through the trap and had him and how the drunken rascal fought me. He gouged and bit with the venom of a very fury, until I got hold of his fallen pistol and slashed him over the head with the barrel. That laid him quiet at last, knocking the senses out of him. I rose, and then found that Ned had not followed me. Ned! I cried. Ned, you're not hit, lad! His head rose through the trap, a grim look in his face. The bullet slew David Spry, he said and came to his feet, looking down at the boy. Sink me, but I can hang this little murderer. No time, I broke in. That shot will fetch the gunner, Ned. Get your pistols. Right, he cried and whirled about. Even as he started toward the lockers, Gunner Basil came running down the passage with a shout to Dickon. There was nothing else to do. I went for him with the empty pistol, and he stopped short in the doorway, his pale eyes popping at sight of me and Ned. His hand flew to the pistol at his belt, but I was ahead of him, and sent him staggering with one shrewd blow in the face. He tried to run for it, with me at his heels, and got to the companionway. Then as he started up from the deck, I had him by the leg. He drew his pistol and fired down, and the bullet actually nicked my cheek and cut the skin of my shoulder, so that he pulled free from me. Nonetheless, I got him, for I reached the deck only a step behind him and gripped his shirt, and he whirled at me with knife up. I caught his wrist, and we went to the deck together while Ned Lowe seized the pistol I had dropped and waited with butt reversed. His chance came as we rolled into the scuppers, and under the smash Gunner Basil relaxed in my grip. I rose, panting, and regarded the man. His face was smeared with blood, and though the eyes were closed, that yellowy parchment face was evil to see. Ned Lowe touched my arm. Get a coil a light line forward, George. We'll tie him up and the boy. Breathing heavily, yet mighty rejoiced to be free, I went forward and got the line. There I paused to glance around, and the pause cost us dear in the end. The King Sagamore lay in the quiet, landlocked bay, with nothing in sight but the long sand spit to seaward and the sand hills around. We were but a cable length from the shore. A sudden shout from Ned Lowe roused me. I caught sight of Dickon, just rising from the companionway, and Ned leaping at him. The boy ran like a hare, evaded Ned, and got to the rail. With one clean plunge, he was overboard. Ned jumped to the fife rail, caught out two of the teak pins, and flung one. It drove within a foot of Dickon's head as he came up and struck out for shore. The little fiend twisted his head and looked up at us. I'll bleed ye yet, ye dogs, he screamed shrilly. Angered, Ned loosed another pin, but Dickon saw it coming and dived. Escaping it, he came up again and struck out for shore. Then I perceived something else and flung a shout at him. Quick boy, sharks astern. True enough, a black fin was cleaving the water, and another after it. 
Dickon redoubled his efforts and made so great a splashing that he got into the shoal water safe and a moment later staggered up on the sand. He paused there only to shake his fist at us, then turned about and ran across the sand and presently was gone over the nearest hill. Ned Lowe and I bound Gunner Basil hand and foot, gagged him and lashed him to the foot of the mainmast. The ship was ours again. And what about Dickon, Ned? I demanded. He shrugged, reading my thought. The chances are ten to one, George, that he'll not find Winter and the men. And if he does, what of it? We have the ship. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of Pirate's Gold, Part 3 of 4, by H. Bedford Jones. If you have enjoyed this book, please become a monthly supporter by going to classictalesaudiobooks.com. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off anything in the store. Give more and you get more. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>